I mean, certainly the obvious, the, the, the obvious thing here is that you need a grid fit for what you have connected to it. And the, the British grid has grown up based around large centralised plants, so coal, to some extent gas, and certainly nuclear. And our grid system is designed to meet, to meet those. So you have portions of the grid in very strange places, and it's only there because of there's an, being a nuclear power plant, for example. So the, the way the system works at the moment is the, the, the Scotland and England are connected by two reasonably high capacity lines, but they are, uh, they're not as high capacity as they need to be, given the amount of generation currently in Scotland and the amount that's expected to come through over the next, next few years. So certainly Scotland is well able to meet its own generation needs, uh, but it is fundamentally ex intending to export m much of that south. So it's one of, there are a number of technical reasons why uh, you, you want reasonably strong grids, uh, and one of those reasons is, is variations in, in power flow, uh, and also the effect of things like faults and so on. So a nice strong grid tends to be what you want to build. Um, so we're, it's a work in progress, um, and, um, but it's not, the British system isn't quite where it needs to be in terms of the amount of renewables it will need to, in, it will need to integrate over the next 15 years. The two aren't necessarily mutually exclusive um, and different types of energy sources are better handled at different levels. So for example, if you're wanting to exploit nuclear, you can't really at the moment do that locally. If you want to exploit offshore wind, to get economies of scale, you need to go very large, so gigawatt scale. Um, equally, there are lots of potential opportunities at local energy level. Um, and one of, those, uh, one of those major opportunities is about trying to better integrate uh, electricity, heat, and um, gas, and transport, for example. There is a potential clash between those two ideas. Uh, personally, I think the actual real solution is a combination of the two. Um, because you've got very large economies of scale for some of our wind resources and um, some potential technical opportunities as well as quite a lot of potential social gains from, from focusing in small. So I, think you, I personally I think you need both. And this idea that local means no grid, I, and we're not there yet. I don't, I don't, I don't see that happening in any time soon. I mean, certainly right now there are no there are no on or offshore wind uh, plums operating or planned that have no subsidy. Um, so offshore, the costs have been considerably higher, and we're talking of the order of um, you know, in some cases two three hundred pounds per megawatt hour. So that's very high. So that's equivalent to twenty thirty pence a kilowatt hour. So it's much higher than domestic um, electricity uh, prices. What we've seen, however, is that um, the way that the, our subsidy regime has changed has had quite a profound effect on the prices paid. So historically, we used something called the Renewable Obligation Certificates, the Renewable Obligation, and that basically was a market mechanism which topped up the prices. We all, when we had the feed-in tariff uh, came in in 2000, on the, on the late, when la one of the final things the Labour government did at that point, um, it adopted a much more Germanic approach where there was a fixed amount. And what that tends to do is that tends to push the prices towards those, towards those values. And as we've moved towards some of the larger system, the, the new system, the contracts for difference, which is a, it's another market mechanism, but it basically gives a, a, a fixed price for generation. So nuclear is exploiting that, offshore wind and others will exploit that as well. And that, what that's tending to do is it's basically giving target prices for developers and it also the way the auction works is tending to push the prices down so we've seen uh, a number of uh, pretty large wind farms um, bidding in at prices of around uh, 114 115 uh, pounds per megawatt hour so that's that's equivalent of about um, uh, 11 or 12 pence per kilowatt hour so it, it's it's very much lower than the 200 or so that we, we, we saw previously. So what's happened there is that you know, that auction site has, has done that. Uh, and the way they, the, the, the farms have achieved that is they've basically tried to scale, scale up by using fewer larger turbines. And some of the turbines planned going in are eight, eight megawatts. So they're very large machines going in. Uh, but the technology has developed very quickly. One of the policy problems in Britain has been 
the, jet, the, the wind turbine size and there's, there's been a limit on the height of the turbine. So uh, if you can get round that, uh, you, you allow a bigger turbine, uh, then you can have bigger generators and the, the cost can come down further. What that does mean, however, is they're a bit more visible. So there is a, a decision to be made there about whether that is something that's desirable or, um, or simply an imperative to get the price down. So it's, a, it's an interesting one. I, I, can see, um, I can see cases coming through very soon where you, it will be roughly subsidy free. Um, the challenge will be that many of the best sites, the windiest sites in particular, have already been constructed. But it's perfectly, conce perfectly see um, conceivable that farms that exist could be essentially repowered by basically you take down the existing turbines, you put up some new big ones. Uh, it would be one very efficient way of, of get generating subsidy free uh, electricity. And I think that, that, that may well come soon. To some extent, that extra variability could be. Uh, I think one of the one of the interesting things from it is that what you will see in in, in the future is uh, is a combination of two things. Is one is a sort of natural variability, which so if we look back over the last 30, 40 years, we can see there are quite substantial swings in um, wind speeds year to year, season to season. And what we're seeing with the, with the climate change side of things is, a, is an additional signal, signal sitting on top of that. So that's, that's an interesting thing in, in, in terms of trying to understand just how big the climate signal is relative to the existing variability. My impression at the moment is that the, it is there, um, but it's relatively small compared to interannual variability. Um, but it doesn't mean that you shouldn't look at it closely. Certainly for, 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 Europe, for Northern Europe, the effects seem to be not as significant as they would be for Sub-Saharan Africa or the United States, where the, the large continental masses uh, and the fact that you've got um, quite different weather patterns and climatic conditions um, mean that you, you, for the, the Europe's relatively well insulated, I think. I think it's probably a credible target. I mean, in, in, in lieu of somebody having a breakthrough in terms of fusion um, or as being able to beam, beam energy from the stars, I, I don't actually see much, much scope. I mean, certainly if you read, to, to basically to do anything other than have 100% renewables, and certainly if you read anything about the extent to which we can pull fossil fuels out of the ground, and, and more importantly, pull them out and burn them, then we're really, you know, we're really not able to do much with fossil fuels. So we've got to use something else. And that's either nuclear fission, um, and even the French are rowing back somewhere somewhat from that. Um, the British appear to be going in the opposite direction. So shy of that infusion, I, I don't see what else we've got. And I, I really only see a logical progression of progressively more integrated systems, progressively has tighter uh, energy efficiency standards, so uh, approaching the passive house standard where basically you don't need heating. I think that is essential and one of the dip that's that, but that's incredibly hard. But and, and while I think you could you can solve a lot of that with things like building standards, um, there are a lot of difficulties with that in the sense that certainly in, in Britain we have a problem with our building standards in that we don't properly enforce them. So there's, and a lot of that is down to uh, the, um, the, if you like, the professionalism of a construction industry, very different to Germany's. Electricity is harder um, to some extent um, because of the variability. So you need to have sufficient to get you through times when you haven't got much. Uh, so this idea of storing energy in large quantities uh, or flexing your demand is, is important. Uh, and then the transportation side of it is, is more interesting. But again, actually, this idea of efficiency helps you. So if you can be more efficient, you are, you're making the thing you're aiming at much more manageable. But it, it, the scale of the problem is enormous. And um, you know, I, personally, I think I'm in the right business. Okay.